Okay, I think we can begin now. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. It's being jointly presented by the Smart Card Alliance and EMVCO. The topic that we'll be presenting is the evolution of payment specifications and tokenization. We can go to the next slide, please. So my name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm the executive director of the Smart Card Alliance and director of the EMV Migration Forum. And joining me today is Brian Byrne, who's Director of Operations for EMVCO. I'll begin the presentation by providing a U.S. payments market perspective on the changes that are rapidly transforming card payments here in the U.S. and how the U.S. market is changing to align with the global payment standards built around the EMV specifications governing payment security and tokenization, which are aptly managed with support and guidance by the global partners who make up EMVCO. I'll hand off things to Brian Byrne from EMVCO to further explain the mission, structure, and engagement efforts at EMVCO to manage the specifications and other resources to ensure that payments are secure and globally interoperable. After Brian is completed, I'll return to assist in the Q&A session that we have uh, with the time remaining. Next slide, please. So let me begin by highlighting the tremendous progress that is being made and the continued effort being put forth by all payments industry stakeholders to continue moving the adoption of chip technology here in the U.S., a market that is the largest payments market in the world and arguably the most complex, diverse, and uniquely challenging market ever to implement EMV. Today we are recognizing a significant milestone, the date for much of the market to be impacted by the U.S. EMV fraud liability shift. That began more than four years ago, and we have been nervously counting down the business days to reach this date ever since. The date marks the beginning and not the end of that journey, but for many, it also should be recognized that the Smart Car Alliance organization has been a major force in the adoption of chip technology that we are recognizing today, even long before the announcements were made by each of the payment brands to set the target date in October of 2015. Next slide, please. So how did we get to where we are today? Well, for many of us, it goes back more than 10 years when the Smart Card Alliance served as a valuable stakeholder education function uh, when contactless payment cards were first introduced in the U.S. around 2004 and consumers, issuers, and merchants needed to understand how chips could generate dynamic data, or cryptogram, to replace static magnetic stripe data. Attention began to shift towards consideration to a shift to the full EMV specification for contact and contactless cards and mobile payments in the years to follow, leading up to the decision to establish the target date for the accelerated adoption of EMV in October of 2015. When that decision became unanimously supported by the four payment brands, the Smart Card Alliance was asked to lead in the formation of a new industry forum, which became the EMV Migration Forum, as a way to address issues that require broad cooperation and coordination, and to ensure that the successful adoption of EMV-enabled cards, devices, and terminals happen in the U.S. market in an efficient, timely and effective manner. The EMV Migration Forum has grown to 175 member organizations and more than 600 individual participants from 10 major stakeholder categories, a first for any type of industry-wide collaboration among key adopters representing payment networks, issuers, merchants, processors, and supported by strong technology providers here in the United States. Next slide, please. There is much more value that can be gained from the EMV shift than increased security and reduced fraud, however. There is value for future innovations that will have a common platform, and the global standards in place today and seeing that those standards continue to evolve and embrace new payments innovation. In the near term, the focus will be on security and fraud reduction from counterfeit card activity. The economic effects of data breaches on the payments industry 
and the impact on the confidence of consumers is no longer sustainable without making these major changes. We also need to be clear the way for future innovation. So new payments form factors like mobile and payments delivery systems like in-app payment and faster payment settlement can find fertile market conditions to grow. And that's going to require global standards to support the needed investment to achieve the scale which depends on the interoperability and trust in the standard setting process. As a result, we need a future of fewer fraud incidents for consumers and merchants and improved products and services from card issuers and, and acceptors. The U.S. consumers will be able to experience that confidence and sense of security when they travel outside of the United States and foreign investors come to the United States will have the same level of experience. Next slide, please. So this visual chart represents some of the significant milestones and, and uh, activities that took place over the last three years of the EMV Migration Forum. And rather than focus on all of the individual milestones, if I could just draw your attention to the far right of the screen where we're in the present day since July of 2015 until today and highlight that a lot of the activity that was focused initially around industry engagement and addressing the required uh, issues and resolutions to those issues to facilitate the U.S. adoption for EMV have been achieved and now we are beginning to shift our focus to what's going beyond October of 2015, namely the other market segments which are still yet to reach their fraud liability shift timeline, the retail petroleum industry and the ATM markets. And more importantly, to focus more attention on market education and uh, industry education and collaboration so that the hard work that's gone into the development of the specifications and the technology and the implementation of that technology will be um, quickly adopted and become accustomed to not only for consumers but for merchants and issuers who perhaps are not part of the front line of the EMV migration that we're seeing take place today. Next slide, please. And so we've seen significant progress so far in the EMV adoption in the U.S. Recent announcements have supported that over 200 million EMV cards have been issued, which if you understand the adult market in the United States, that's about equal to the adult uh, people in the U.S. that have uh, payment cards to use in this, uh, this marketplace. Also, Visa has announced that their chip issuance in the U.S. is now larger or higher than they've issued in any other individual country around the world. Over 151 million Visa chip cards have been issued in the U.S. as of September 15, 2015. We're also estimating that about 314,000 merchant locations are now accepting EMV chip transactions. And many of the transactions that are happening today are coming from small and medium-sized businesses, the small shops that make up the vast majority of retail touch points for consumers um, are starting to adopt EMV, and we're starting to see a significant amount of chip or transactions coming through those channels. More importantly, the largest retailers are reporting a significant number of chip-on-chip -chip transactions in those locations which have enabled their cards. And so we have high confidence that the chip technology that's in the market today is working efficiently and correctly and that the transactions are flowing through the system as they had been planned to do. Uh, just yesterday, the Payment Security Task Force, um, ANIS, released some data and they estimate about 40% of the terminals will be capable of accepting chip cards by the end of 2015 in the U.S. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, the EMV Migration Forum has taken a significant role in the building the education and awareness process for the EMV migration. And with such a large market and with so many participants, it's difficult to find a single channel for how we can educate, inform, 
and get um, uh, stakeholders comfortable with the changes that are happening with the EMV chip technology. So we've done a number of significant efforts, both from a standpoint of, of web resources. Um, we established the gochipcard.com website to be a go-to site for consumers, merchants, and issuers to follow um, using uh, easy to read and understand graphics and frequently asked questions documents and to provide links to other resources so that people would feel comfortable once they've become aware of what the chip technology and the changes that are happening in the market. We also went through a very significant um, marketing campaign called Chip In where we encouraged um, all industry stakeholders to um, forward and reuse many of the resources that were developed by the EMV Migration Forum to educate the market. We've produced video to provide media outlets with visual clues in terms of how the technology is evolving and make it easier for um, those media outlets to be able to produce and deliver um, sound quality messages that would be consistent across the market. And then we've produced a number of industry resources and white papers to help um, educate other stakeholders about uh, the fraud liability shift and also to address the known concerns that are out in the market regarding um, what may happen with card not present fraud after the card present or con uh, counterfeit card fraud um, is addressed with the advent of the EMV chip card. Um, one of the unique aspects of the U.S. market has been its uh, debit card market which has created a certain level of uh, of technical challenges for issuers and merchants and processors to address. And uh, the EMV Migration Forum has led the discussions and have largely resolved all of those uh, debit-related issues, which is going to pave the way for more um, uh, further uh, adoption of, uh, of debit cards and debit card acceptance in the U.S. market. And then we've also provided numerous webinars and other resources to talk about um, EMV, such as the, the one we finished recently um, regarding how EMV uh, changes are taking place at ATM machines across the market. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to now uh, hand over the uh, presentation to my colleague Brian Byrne from EMVCO, who is going to talk in more detail about um, the global payment specifications work that's being done by that global organization. Brian? Thank you, Randy. And uh, yeah, certainly a very exciting, uh, very exciting day for EMV in the U.S. But uh, as Randy mentioned, now we're going to uh, take a bit more of a global look at things. Um, my name, as Randy mentioned, is Brian Byrne. I'm the EMV co-director of operations, a role that I've held for the last two and a half years. Next slide. So what I'm going to cover in the next half hour or so is I'm going to give you a bit of background on EMV Co. You know, what is this organization? Um, what's our history, our scope? And I'm going to talk about EMV Co's activities. Certainly not everything that we do, but just uh, some of our key activities around chip and uh, current chip, future of chip. And I'm also going to talk a bit about payment tokenization. And then also I'd like to touch on 3D Secure, a newest initiative. And I'd also like to wrap up then uh, with a little bit of discussion around our industry engagement mechanism. Next slide. So first I'd like to start with uh, history. And you really can't talk about the history of EMV Co without at least briefly touching on the history of EMV. Next slide. So back in the early 1990s, a lot of countries had implemented MagStripe technology for payments. And countries were seeing fraud. They were seeing fraud, particularly counterfeit fraud on the MagStripes. And particularly in Europe, particularly in France and the UK, uh, they decided to address this fraud by implementing chip cards uh, based on a, a new ISO standard related to chip. And so the banks um, individually, or at least at a national level, got together and they created specifications on top of these ISO standards. And those specifications were the basis for their own domestic uh, chip card implementations. Now, they were very effective in driving down counterfeit fraud, 
but what quickly happened, particularly uh, in a region like Europe where the countries are all in very close proximity, what very quickly happened is the domestic fraud went away, but the uh, cross-border counterfeit fraud skyrocketed. So a decision was made by the three, three big payment networks at the time in Europe, Europay, the European debit network, MasterCard and Visa, that they would come together and that they would create a set of specifications that were not just domestic, but could support global interoperability. Next slide, please. So uh, they formed the, uh, they came together and created the first EMV specification. And the EMV specification was then supported by an uh, organization to manage its care and feeding called EMVCO. Now EMVCO's mission today is to facilitate the worldwide interoperability and acceptance of secure payment transactions by managing and evolving the EMV specs and their related testing procedures. So originally when EMVCO was formed, the word chip was in there to facilitate the worldwide interoperability and acceptance of secure chip payment transactions. But we've gone beyond that and EMD CoScope has expanded considerably, particularly in the last few years. Next slide, please. So while uh, contact chip is certainly the, the heart of what EMD Co did, this gives you a flavor for how we evolved over the years. Um, we put in chip, then we created the type approval processes. We went on various areas around chip security, contactless and mobile, next gen, several of these things I'll talk on in the presentation. But we've continued to evolve and expand our scope. And you know, we're constantly looking at what areas does it make sense? Well, what areas does it make sense for EMD Co to engage in? Where where is the right balance between cooperation and competition between uh, all of the global payment brands? Next slide, please. So now I'd like to touch a little bit on how EMD Co as an organization is structured. Next slide. As I mentioned, EMVCO, uh, originally EMV, European MasterCard and Visa, European no longer exists, uh, was formed. But even when it was first formed, um, we had a board of advisors created. Now that initial board of advisors primarily gave us direction from issuing and acquiring banks. And then over time, JCB joined, American Express joined. In 2010, we went through a major overhaul of how we engage with the payments industry around the world. And then in 2013, uh, Union Pay and Discover joined. So now you have the six global brands who are participating in the activities of EMD Co. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to talk just for a second about how we're structured, how we actually accomplish things within EMD Co and how we work on all of these different specifications and type approval processes. So I'm gonna start on the right-hand side of this slide, the dark blue area. So EMVCO is made up of a number of working groups and they take their direction from the board of managers. Now most of these dark blue boxes, the task forces, the working groups, the board of managers, these are payment system staff. There are currently over 230 payment system staff from the brands around the world who devote um, varying proportions of their time to forwarding the EMV activities. And they are the ones who are actually coming up with the draft specs and the draft testing. But they're not doing that in isolation. And I'd like to look now at the left-hand side. You know, where do we get our strategic focus? Well, we have an executive committee, again, made up of the uh, senior folks on the brands, but they're taking their direction from a board of advisors. And that board of advisors is made up of two key areas. It's made up of our business associates. Now, originally, the Board of Advisors, as I mentioned, was really mainly just issuing and acquiring banks. But that's evolved. Now, um, any, any organization that has a direct financial responsibility for an EMV transaction is eligible to be a business associate. And those business associates now represent a lot of different verticals. We uh, have participation from major merchants around the world and from transaction processes and from a lot of their representative bodies. So now we're touching on all of the elements of the EMV transaction life cycle. But we also have elected technical associates. And the distinction between business and technical associates, well, the first distinction is any organization can become a technical associate. 
It, there's no um, criteria. You just have to have an active interest in EMV transactions and the EMV specifications. But those technical associates not only participate, there are some elected onto our board of advisors, but they're also very heavily engaged in the work that our working groups do and our task forces. So um, I'd like to summarize the distinction is the business associates and the board of advisors, they're providing us direction on what EMV Co should be doing, and the technical associates are providing us direction and input on how we should be doing it, both critical. And of course, we have our subscriber community. I'm sure some of you on the call today are either in associate organizations or subscribers, but our subscribers are individuals or companies who like to stay plugged into what EMV Co is doing. We meet with them face-to-face -face every year. We give them advanced notification on specifications. And we like to engage uh, at a broad level with the subscriber community through um, our query and website of uh, materials. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to discuss now for a second is just to clarify a bit of confusion between the roles of EMVCO and the payment systems. So yes, EMVCO is owned by the global brands, but we have a very defined remit and it, it's legally defined for a number of very important reasons. You know, this is an environment where these competitors can get together and they focus on managing and evolving the specs, how to test against those specs, elements related to security, and how to keep evolving payments for the future. Now that's distinctly different from either the global, the regional, or the domestic payment systems because they're the ones who are saying, okay, these are the sort of products we want developed based on the specs. This is the sort of EMV roadmap we want for our company or our country, depending on the organization. So when it comes down to pricing and interchange, all of those decisions are very distinctly not part of EMV Co's role. And even today, a momentous day in the US, the fraud liability ship policy, all of those policy decisions, I can guarantee you those discussions are not happening uh, at a joint table within EMV Co. Next slide, please. So there's a bit of background on our structure and who we are. Now I'd like to talk briefly about some of our key activities. Next slide, please. And the first area I'm gonna to touch on is chip, contact and contactless chip, whether it's in cards or whether it's in mobile phones. Next slide, please. So our core specification is the EMV 4.3 contact chip specification. And this spec provides the blueprint or the toolbox for chip cards and their insertion into chip readers. And we're talking about a uh, transaction time of a couple of seconds. Next slide, please. So there's a point I, that I like to make uh, on this topic. Uh, I speak at a lot of conferences. Occasionally, uh, the question comes up, well, you know, isn't the EMV specification 20 years old? Why, why would a country like the US, for example, who's just moving to EMV, why would we be adopting an old solution? And it is true that the original version of the spec is 20 years old, but that's not the spec that we use anymore. Uh, 4.3 is only a few years old, but not only is it only a few years old, we're constantly managing and maintaining the specification, responding to queries, putting out update bulletins. So in fact, at any given time, the EMV specification that's being implemented today is probably no, no more than a couple of months old. Next slide, please. So in the contactless space, the EMV key specification here, the EMV contactless 2.5, and now we're talking about transactions where you're tapping. You're still using the same strong EMV cryptography, but you're tapping originally a card, and transaction time is very fast, uh, under 500 milliseconds. But now, of course, we've moved on beyond cards, stickers, bulbs, watches, and of course, uh, the big one, uh, mobile phones. Next slide, please. So one of the things we found when EMVCO was first formed is, okay, we put out specifications, that's great, everyone has the specs, so they're gonna build products to those specs, and we're gonna have global interoperability, and that's great. Well, it's not exactly how it worked out. What we found very quickly that specs without some form of testing and type approval don't deliver the global interoperability that we all want and need. Next slide, please. So EMV does some key testing and approval work. Uh, on the terminal side, we do both level one and level two testing. 
um, I know the engineers always give me grief over this, but um, you know, level one is basically hardware, level two is basically software. So we test, test the terminals, we test them for level one and level two compliance. Now on the card or the mobile handset approval, uh, we're again, we're testing the functional elements, we're checking the electromagnetic elements. Uh, we do have, a, we do have a, a small efforts that we have for the common payment application, but primarily our efforts here in the card and mobile handset type approval are related to level one. Um, and we're also very excited that uh, in 2016 we're moving into, into testing for level one on mobile handsets. This is something that was previously done by the payment systems um, and is moving into uh, EMVCO. You know, as, as with other things, it makes a lot more sense to have testing done jointly if the payment systems are basically testing for the same thing. And the other area of testing and approval that we do is critically important is determining whether the chips or the chip platforms are secure. And in this case, we want to make sure that the chips that are being used for EMV, you know, whether they're in phones, whether they're in cards, are they chips that we know that are designed to protect against known attacks? Next slide, please. So I do want to clarify here for a second the different roles between EMVCO and the payment systems. I just talked about EMVCO's role. The payment system's role is to actually come up with the rules governing how long those approved products should be out in the field, to do the rest of the testing, to do the host system, the deployment, testing and approval, although EMVCO is, does have a task force that's looking into terminal integration, so we may have an uh, increased role in that in the future. Um, they're doing the type approval processes for chip cards that comply with their card application spec. They're doing the functional and the personalization approvals. So that's how the roles defined between EMVCO and the payment systems. Next slide, please. So I've just talked to you about what we do in the current envir environment on CHIP. I'd like to speak for a couple of seconds now about EMV Next Generation. Next slide, please. So the EMV Next Generation project is something that we launched a few years ago, and it's really a white, a blank page approach to EMV. If we were to start again based on everything we know now, how would we design EMV chips? What would we do? Well, the first thing we would do is we would build a single kernel for acceptance uh, with a common robust technology that can support all of the different interfaces that we know about and cleanly support online and offline transactions. Now, some of you may know that uh, through a number of different reasons, a number of different evolutions, we have a single kernel for contact chip and we have an umbrella framework for contactless kernels. We have multiple contactless kernels that are supported. Now, while this is all actually being quite efficiently supported by the industry, we do acknowledge that in a perfect world, it would be better to have a single kernel, and that's what we're working on for the next generation project. The other driver that forced us to take a look at this was when it comes to offline authentication. We use uh, RSA as our basis, and RSA is a very strong cryptography platform, public-private key platform, which has um, got an expected life, at least the implementations that we're using, an expected life out to 2025 or 2030. But we want to look beyond that. EMVCO's role as a global body is to look into the far future and say, what do we need to do now so that we've got the right infrastructure in the future? So we came up with the Next Generation Project. Next slide, please. Now, whenever I talk about the Next Generation Project, um, I do like to assure people that, yes, we've been working on this for several years, and yes, we expect to have a specification done in 2016 and testing available in 2017. However, that does not mean that the world's gonna be quickly migrating to this technology. There may be some countries who decide to start implementing Next Generation-based EMV by 2020, uh, we'll be managing a migration path and coordinating that across the payment systems within EMVCO. Although the primary migration is really going to be determined um, not by EMVCO, but will at least act in a facilitation role. But the fact of the matter is we don't expect EMV next generation to effectively be the new form of EMV on a worldwide basis, probably until 2030. So if you were deploying today, we're telling you that maybe in 15 to 20 years, you might be wanting to think to a new, move to a new technology, which we think is 
you know, not an unreasonable thing to say in the world of payments technology. Next slide. Okay, so what I'd like to talk to you about now is some of the newer initiatives that EMBCO has taken on. Uh, the first one I'm going to cover is payment tokenization. Next slide. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the term tokenization. Hey, it's very broadly used in the industry. And EMV's payment tokenization does rely on the same concept, the same fundamental concept, which is let's replace the PAN, primary account number, with a token. Now, in our case, however, we are focusing on a payment token that can actually transmit throughout the entire life cycle of the transaction. And this is distinct from other tokens that are used usually on data at rest to protect storage. So the concept um, is to take that traditional card number, replace it with a PAN, and to create a payment token environment which is restricted specifically by domain. It might be by device, might be by merchant, might be by transaction type or channel. And the value proposition behind doing that is that if that particular environment is compromised, if a merchant location is compromised or a channel is compromised, you haven't compromised the underlying account number, you don't have to reissue it. In fact, you can unlink that compromised token from the account number. And what it really does is it devalues the data, it devalues the incentive to even want to try and compromise that information. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk you through just one use case on payment tokenization just to give you uh, greater insight into how the process works. In this case, we're going to be using a scenario where a cardholder's got a mobile phone, and that mobile phone has been personalized, not with the primary account number, but instead has been personalized with a payment token. So the cardholder goes to the merchant, taps on the contactless reader, transmits the information. Now, the PAN is in the same 15 or 16-digit format that the merchant's used to dealing with, on traditional payment account numbers. And so they're going to take that PAN, in, that, excuse me, that token in information, they're going to add the, uh, the transaction information. They're going to send that payment token over to their acquirer. The acquirer is going to forward that information onto a token service provider. Now that token service provider is going to maintain a vault, and that vault is going to enable it to detokenize, to go and find the original underlying PAN and they're going to exchange information with the payment network that issued that card product in the first place. And through that exchange, the original PAN is going to be sent to the issuer. The issuer hopefully is going to make an approval decision, send that information back to the payment network, through the token service provider again, back to the token that was submitted originally. That token goes back to the acquirer. That token then goes back to the merchant. The merchant's got their approval and the transaction is complete. Next slide, please. So that's an example of how it works in an NFC environment. But token, payment tokens have a much broader applicability. Payment tokens are going to be able to be used to card on file merchants, to devalue the data that's stored there. They're going to be able to be used in digital wallets. So when you're doing electronic commerce transactions, you're going to be sending payment, transact, payment tokens through instead of original PAN. They've got applicability to QR and barcode solutions. And further down the track, we're even looking at the possibility of, you know, what's the value concept of putting instead of the live pan on the chip, perhaps a token. But that's certainly not the highest priority. We're, we're going after the bigger areas of risk first. Next slide, please. So I've touched very briefly on this topic. I would like to encourage all of you, if you have an active interest in EMB Code's work on payment tokenization, to join us at our next webinar on November 4th where we're going to be spending the whole hour talking about tokenization. This is another joint webinar with the SCA. Um, the SCA is going to be talking about tokenization in general, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into our payment tokenization work. But I do want to give you some updates on where we are. Um, initially, EMVCO had planned on releasing the second version of the specification uh, towards the end of this year. But we've had so much industry engagement, so much feedback, so much request for clarification, so much request for consideration of additional use cases, uh, which is all great. It's fantastic that we've got this high level of industry engagement, but it means that we're going to need time to absorb and respond and reflect that in the next version of the specification. 
So we're now looking probably at second quarter of 2016 before we'll be releasing the next version of the specification. Now with that said, however, there are a couple of areas that we are moving on in 2015. The concept of the payment account reference. And a payment account reference, again, could be a long, a long discussion in its own right, but quite simply, it's a concept of saying, okay, if there are multiple payment tokens across multiple domains and channels, is there a way for me to tie that back to the consumer without exposing financial information? And yes, there is. There is a way to do that, and it's called a payment account reference. We've already put out a draft specification and hope to have that finalized this year. And the other thing that we'll be releasing this year is the processes for um, multiple organizations to register as token service providers. Next slide, please. So the next area I'd like to talk about is 3D Secure. So next slide, please. If you're not familiar with 3D Secure, uh, the 3D stands for three domains, the merchant acquirer domain, the interoperability domain, and the issuer domain. Now the concept behind 3D Secure is in an electronic commerce environment where the card holder is not present, they're not there face to face with the merchant, is there a way that we can more robustly authenticate the card holder who's doing the transaction? So the concept behind 3D Secure is that the card holder has a direct and secure communication channel with the card issuer. The card issuer authenticates the identity of the card holder and that authentication becomes part of the transaction record and is applied by the different payment systems in terms of providing additional rights and protections to the merchant. So the concept is very robust. Unfortunately, the implementation has been problematic. Next slide, please. So today, the 3DS specification is maintained by Visa. Uh, they're the owners of 1.0, and the decision was made that Ianvico would be the appropriate body to take on the overhaul, the revision of the 3DS specification to come up with 2.0. Now, while we're still going to have implementations of this specification by the payment systems, you might know the implementations by such names as VBV or Secure Code or SafeKey, it's going to be Ianvico who's writing the underlying protocol that's used to create those programs. So why are we working on this? What's the need to do this? Well, the key need is, firstly, 3DS currently only is supported in browser environments. And depending on which research you read or which study you look at, 25% of the electronic commerce transactions are now initiated on the mobile phone. So we need a solution that works with apps, not just a solution that works with your web browser. The next, thing, the next thing we need is uh, better integration with the merchant's offering. And one of the challenges we have with the initial implementation of 3DS is every transaction effectively is somewhat interrupted for a challenge response. And you know, this has led, unfortunately, to transaction abandonment. And um, we're looking to create a smoother integration so that we can minimize that problem. And one of the ways we want to minimize that problem is to reduce the friction. And the friction we're talking about is the need for this interaction. So we're looking at a better environment in, the, in 3DS 2.0 so that we can actually minimize the number of times that the cardholder is actually challenged and yet still have this process running as much as possible transparently in the background. So if, uh, next slide please. Okay. So I've talked about a couple of these things, the need for supporting multiple platforms, the need for um, intelligent risk-based decisioning is a way that we hope that we can reduce the friction. Let's use the tools we have out there to minimize perhaps by 70 or 80 percent the number of times there even needs to be a challenge response. The other thing that we're very interested in is looking at payment tokenization and looking at 3DS and looking at the possible applicability for identification and verification. Now, some of you may have heard that uh, when one of the releases using payment tokenization and mobile phones went out, there was an initial spike in fraud and investigation showed that there was nothing wrong with the underlying technology, but there were some issues with not appropriate mechanisms being used to identify the holder of the card before it was personalized under the phone. 
So we're already looking at EMD as to how can we use 3DS as a complementary process? How can we make it a part of a more robust ID and D process in the personalization of the phones? And the last thing that we hope to obtain from the new specification or plan to obtain is to make sure that we make it more flexible to deal with country and specific and regulatory requirements around the world. Next slide, please. So within 3D Secure, um, what's our focus? Well, as I've mentioned, key focus is going to be, you know, let's get a solution that works for mobile phone apps. And then, of course, we want to focus on challenge response, um, we want to look at ID and V. What's our timeline? Um, actively engage with the industry right now, talking heavily to our associates primarily on the, the draft specifications, the business requirements. In 2016, our goal is to publish the uh, specification, uh, get the testing and approval processes underway. But of course, uh, it's going to depend on uh, the level of uh, responses we get, and the responses we get to a first draft. But it's a very, very active area for EMBCO, and we're pushing very strongly uh, to roll this out as quickly as we can. Next slide. So many times through this session, I've talked about industry engagement. I want to highlight a couple of things right now. Next slide, please. You know, Invico has multiple channels through which we engage with the industry. Clearly, our associates program is the key, our engagement with our subscribers. But we also have a number of partnerships with other bodies. We do a lot of speaking engagements around the world, panels, seminars, webinars like this. Uh, and particularly, a lot of information sharing on our website, a lot of information that's available on the, to the public. Uh, we do press releases. We have a LinkedIn presence. Please connect with us there if you want to stay updated on what we're doing. Um, clearly, of course, we're issuing specifications, and uh, we have uh, white papers on different topics. And so basically, we are actively engaged across multiple touch points with the industry. Next slide, please. Now, there is one thing that I wanted to, to focus on uh, when it comes to engagement with other bodies. And this has been a point of confusion um, in the industry. You know, Ian Vico does its work based on ISO standards and, you know, or ANSI, which is the US equivalent of ISO standards. And we take those standards and we build out specifications that are globally interoperable. And that's a key distinction, the globally interoperable component. I mean, anyone who travels the world, uh, you'll see different size power outlets, different power sources. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different technologies around the world that are all ISO compliant, but they're not globally interoperable. And that's our core mission at EMD Co. You know, we need our specifications to be an extension of the work that's done by ANSI or ISO, and we need those global specifications to be interoperable. And of course, our focus is on payment security, but we engage with global platform who are focused on multi-application chip environments, PCI on data security, the NFC forum whose focus is on all forms of contactless transactions, and GSMA who are focused on mobile applications. Next slide, please. But we don't only engage with the global bodies. We certainly work directly with a lot of regional and national bodies, Africa and Asia, European Payments Council in Europe, and of course, uh, we're very actively engaged with the Smart Card Alliance and the EMD Migration Forum here in the US. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned a couple of times the associates program. If your company's not already an associate, I would strongly suggest that you at least take a look at this proposition. Next slide, please. Um, the reason that companies become EMD co-associates they value the access to all of the payment system uh, subject matter experts. They value the insight that they get about where we're going. They certainly value their ability to influence our future specifications and testing. And of course, they appreciate the foresight as to what's coming in the next sometimes five to 10 years, sometimes three to six months. Next slide, please. And of course, those those organizations that become associates are providing us direct feedback and input into the work that we're doing in multiple areas, including some of the areas that I've touched on today. Next slide, please. So just to wrap this up, um, I'd like to say that EMV Co, next slide, please. EMV Co serves um, as an industry body to provide a toolbox for the rest of the world 
so that they can pick and choose from that toolbox to implement EMV as it best meets, meets their needs. I think I've talked about most of the points on this page. The only one I'd like to emphasize that I don't think I have talked about is one of the things that makes EMV code different from other bodies around the world is that we have a strong commitment to royalty-free access to our specifications. And that means that if you're building payment or acceptance products based on our specifications, you can do so safe in the knowledge that no one's going to come back to you after the fact and say, well, um, you know, great, you've rolled out millions of these devices, you owe me 20 cents a device or you owe me $2 a terminal. So that's the importance of the EMD code commitment to royalty-free access. So I hope I've given you a flavor for what we do, talked about some of the work we're doing on payment tokenization, but would certainly encourage you if you want a deep dive to join us for the next webinar. A lot of information on our website. Uh, strongly encourage you to go there, visit us, join us on LinkedIn. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Randy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you all for uh, your attention and for some of the great questions that have been submitted. If you do have further questions, either about the US migration to EMV or about um, EMVCO and their programs and their uh, strategies that Brian has just articulated, um, now's the time to submit those questions. And so, uh, Brian, there uh, were several questions that came in during the course of your presentation that I'd like to jump on. Um, the first of which is, um, how does um, PCI DSS um, be applicable to the environment that also applies to tokenization under EMVCO? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. Um, certainly, I'm not a PCI. DSS expert, and I can't speak for that body. Um, I can tell you that we've been working very closely with PCI. For example, uh, PCI is creating a set of standards around how do you be a secure uh, token service provider. And PCI is coming up with a set of standards uh, around security and tokenization in general, whether it's a payment tokenization um, or a um, uh, a, a data at rest, a closed loop tokenization solution. Um, I can tell you that, you know, certainly there's no silver bullet. Um, you know, I, I think with every new technology development, this question always comes up as to, well, does this, does this mean I don't have any PCI DSS responsibility? Um, you know, the fact of the matter is we're operating in multiple layers. For a long time, there are going to be live payment accounts numbers out there with uh, payment tokens. There are going to be uh, uh, chip transactions out there with mag stripe transactions. So you know as long as as long as it is possible to take mag stripe data, compromise it, um, I think there will continue to be a role for PCI DSS. Thanks, Brian. Another question. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, EMVCO's outreach to other standards bodies. Um, so what role um, does EMVCO have compared to the role of ANSI in the specifications around payment tokenization? Yeah, sure. An excellent question. So, I mean, for those who aren't clear, ANSI is effectively the U.S. body that, uh, that then liaises and takes its material to ISO, which is the global body. And um, our experience has been that um, we do our best to work with ISO standards, and and in this case, ANSI is effectively a subset of that work effort. But as I mentioned earlier, our specification work has to be globally interoperable. Um, our experience with ANSI and then its interaction with ISO has been that you know they will develop work. We will leverage it wherever we can. In fact, there are a lot of payment system staff who participate both in EMVCO and on ANSI and in ISO. So we have a heavy overlap and engagement between the two bodies. But our role is always going to be to take standards and turn them into globally interoperable specifications. So we don't see ourselves competing. We see ourselves building upon that work. And one of the newer issues that have come up has to do with the use of biometrics in the payments industry. Um, will EMVCO standardize biometrics usage in payments through 3D Secure 3.0? Um, excellent question. 
Uh, the answer is I'm not sure yet. Um, you know, when I started off the presentation, I talked about the fact that EUVCO is constantly evaluating areas where it makes it makes sense for us to be involved. And there's a constant there's a constant balance that uh, we try and maintain between areas where it's in the best interests of, interests of the payments ecosystem to compete and areas where it's in the best interests of the payments system to actually cooperate on underlying standards and specifications. Um, we are already engaged with FIDO. We're talking to them. Uh, we're certainly looking at the area of um, biometrics, um, but it's not, uh, it's not something that's formally on our roadmap yet. Thanks, and I'd like to take this question, which is about the U.S. EMV migration. And um, someone um, asked if I could comment on the progress that's been made with regard to um, merchants enabling their businesses for EMV. And, and the question came in, um, do we have an accurate uh, count on the number of uh, merchant terminals that are enabled or will be enabled today, uh, being the, the date of the liability shift? Um, we, we don't have really strong data available to us. We have certainly heard very encouraging reports um, just yesterday from Visa in their press release and from the announcement made by the Payment Security Task Force in terms of over 300,000 merchant terminals and expectations in terms of uh, the number of merchants that are going to be enabled by the end of the year. I just want to point out to everybody that um, we don't consider October 1 to be um, a significant date other than it is the milestone for when uh, merchants and issuers were expected to be ready. And we're very encouraged by the reports that consumers have received their chip cards and both large and small businesses have become enabled to accept them. I think it's noteworthy to re realize that um, the, the largest issuers of the payment cards have issued their cards to their highest volume and highest transaction value customers first. And so even if there is um, um, less than uh, a full uh, conversion of the chip cards in the market today, I think the transaction volumes of chip on chip transactions are going to be significant because the people that use their cards most frequently um, in locations which they shop in most often are going to be the ones that are going to see um, the most uh, opportunities to use those cards. And so we expect that migration to continue over the next few months and into 2016. And we see this as a long-term process um, moving forward uh, towards making the entire payments industry more secure. And we have time for one more question here. And uh, Brian, this one's back to you. Um, um, it had to do with the, the discussion around um, uh, tokenization and um, a question about what is the role of tokenization in the advancement of the 3D Secure 2.0 specifications? OK. Um, certainly, we see them as complementary. Um, and I, I hope I touched on this a little bit as well. Um, you know, we see that the personalization of a token onto a phone or the personalization of a token into a digital wallet uh, is a key step that needs to be supported by very robust identification and verification. So we see a direct connection between um, using the 3DS protocol uh, as a means for solidly identifying the cardholder before they do that, uh, before they do that initial personalization, uh, protecting and making sure that the right payment token is going into the card. Um, you know, I can tell you that we are literally writing the 3DS 2.0 spec now. So unfortunately, I can't give you a more definitive answer. But I can tell you that the two groups are working both very closely together. Um, I think I'd like to emphasize again that um, we don't see these as competing technologies. We see them as complementary technologies. Um, you know, in, when maintaining payment security, you're constantly looking at multiple options, multiple tools.
Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, if we could just go to the wrap-up slide, please. Um, I want to thank everyone for their uh, participation in today's uh, webinar and also uh, for the great questions that you submitted. And thank you, Brian, for your contributions. Uh, just a quick note on some things that are coming up. Um, the next Smart Car Alliance and EMVCO webinar that we've mentioned will be focusing on the topic of tokenization. That date is November 4th, 2015, and we'll be sending out uh, notices to that effect, but you can go to that site right now uh, that's on your screen and, um, and link and, uh, and register for that. Also, we have uh, some uh, major events coming up, both in terms of EMVCO as well as the Smart Card Alliance. So please uh, mark your calendars if you're interested in participating in the EMVCO regional seminars, uh, one coming up later this month in, in Barcelona and followed by the November event in uh, Indonesia. And the Smart Card Alliance is holding its annual payment summit um, April 5th and 7th, 2016. And the website for information and registration for that site is also available on your screen. And uh, we wanted to highlight some really valuable resources for those of you who are looking for additional information about um, payments and uh, the EMV standards. And, and please go to the EMVCO website, the Smart Card Alliance website, um, the separate EMVConnection.com website we stood up as the, the communication portal for all things related to EMV, and the GoChipCard.com website for our uh, consumers and merchants and issuers who are looking for resources about uh, the migration. Um, so thank you again for your uh, cooperation and your participation today. Um, feel free to contact either Brian or myself if you have any follow-up to this. And we look forward to having you participate again at our future webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.